please. Ay, ay, ay. Where, where do you go after that? That was incredible. Oh, Lord help us. Look, I, I'm going to stretch you guys a little bit tonight because this stuff is... Um, oh, there it is again. Is, is he here? Don't slam the table, L.A. First of all, thanks for coming out. Really appreciate it. And some of you have been for all the sessions. And I kind of went a little long. And I'm gonna, I have a lot of material to go through tonight, so I'm, I'm going to try to keep it on track. That's my pledge to you. <clears throat> but I am L.A. Marzulli, Yak Yak Yak, books, bunch of films. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, by the way. And I, a pastor was talking about, will you come back? And I said, are you kidding me? Of course I will come back. I'd love, I'm honored to be here. Uh, and the honor is all mine. Our, our mission statement is to expose the deception of the prince of the power of the air to expose the deception of the prince of the power of the air, and to herald the return of the king, Yeshua, Jesus. And that's what we do. I mean, that is our mission statement. And there's another thing, I, I think I talked about this last night, but we kind of poke the dragon. We've all heard the expression, poke the bear. We poke the dragon. And I had this little thing in my, in my um, prayer stuff in the morning, which I wash my head with, my mind with, and it's, it basically says oppression slash attack index from zero to 10. And it, and it waxes and wanes throughout the day, depending on what we're doing. Some days there's nothing. Other days it can be a seven or an eight, which, um, so it, it can be, you know, alarming. And I remember even last week going to the Lord and said, well, why, why does this keep happening? And he says, you're poking the dragon. What do you expect him to do? Not to come after you? Not to try to silence you? Not to attack you in some way? And, I, you know, people come up to me and say, L.A., you know, we pray for you. And I go, you know, your prayers are probably the reason why I'm alive. So the first rabbit trail of the night is I was approached by a guy from a deep state in 2016. And this guy was from the deep state. He showed me his, you know, his, his little badge with his, you know, numbers. And he was a black. It was so funny. We were at the Dallas Hotel at here at the Washington Conference. And I would meet him. In, I was supposed to meet this guy in the lobby, public place not a restaurant, public place, the lobby. And I had a security guy with me from here, the watchman, who, by the way, was packing. So we, we were not going to take any prisoners. We didn't know who this guy was or what we are going to get into. So we go in there, and, and we walk into the lobby, and he's at the far end of the lobby, about 50, 60 feet away. He's got this black suit on with black sunglasses, and I go, there he is. Never seen a picture of him, had no idea, but obviously the spook stood out like a sore thumb. And so we went up there, and he introduced himself, showed his, his badge and stuff, and this is how we started the conversation. L.A., what kind of, and I say this publicly, because if something ever happens, you know that it wasn't me, okay? Uh, like a suicide or something, right? And he goes, L.A., what kind of cell phone do you have? I go, I have an iPhone. He goes, well, is, is it protected? I go, no, why? And he goes, well, you know, when they come and arrest you, they could find kitty porn on the, the cell phone. I'm just kind of going, okay, isn't that interesting? What kind of car do you drive? I have an old 1991 sports car, which I've kind of restored and kept in shape. I call it the go-kart. And he goes, does it have a computer? And I go, yeah, I think it's got a computer. And he goes, well, you know, we have ways of making the accelerator stick to the bottom and, you know, it look like an accident. Okay. Number three, he goes, do you have any kids, L.A.? I go, yeah, I have two daughters. He goes, well, one of them could go missing and never be found. And at this point, I'm like, my brain is like, in a blender. <laughs> I mean, it really is. I'm pretty freaked out. And the Spirit of the Lord, you know, kind of comes on me, and I just look at him right in the eye, and I said, well, you know, that's true. You guys have all the toys. You have all the ways of taking me out. I I'm nobody. I get that. There's no way I can defend against this, and I'm not going to encode my iPhone and, and do all this other crazy stuff, and I'm not going to get paranoid. But here's the deal. You can't take me out unless he allows it. And that's the end of the story. You can't take me out unless he, and he just went, he'd never heard that before. And so that's what I believe. So about a month and a half, two months later, I'm in the go-kart, the little red go-kart. I'm driving up Ensenal Canyon, which is the canyon over from where we used to live in, in, um, in Malibu. And you can do 55, and there was some slow poking in front of me who was doing about 58. And uh, <laughs> so I immediately swerved around him with a nice about a, at least a half a mile of straight on before I had to make this left turn. And so I'm, I'm up, you know, I'm pushing the needle a little bit, but <clears throat> certainly below 80. Praise the Lord. And there's nobody on the road, and I'm having fun in the go-kart. 
and I'm coming around this turn. It's, it's, it's like a, it's a very sharp turn. So I slow down about 55, 60. And the thought pops into my head. You know, if you, if you go over the cliff here, you would be dead. Out of nowhere, this thought comes into my head, right? Out of nowhere. And so the road bends like this, and there's a precipice, which, you know, you go over there, or you're dead. It's over. And all of a sudden, I hear this, tunk. this happens all within like two seconds. Poop! And there's no, no, no power steering. There's, 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 and I'm headed to the edge. The car is locked, and I'm headed to the edge. And I have no idea what's going on. I jam on the brakes and fishtail on the gravel. And you just stop, and I'm just kind of going, what just happened? The car's still running, but that's it. And I get out of the car, I turn the car off, I get out, pop the hood, and I look at the serpentine belt. I kind of go, oh boy. So when the tow truck comes to tow the car, I go to the driver, I go, hey, take a look at this. What do you think, what does this look like to you? He looks at the serpentine belt and he goes, do you have any enemies? It was cut. It was cut. There were like six bands. Two was cut here, and then moved over about two inches, two more were cut, moved over two inches, two more were cut, just slightly. If my wife had been driving the car, there's no way she would have ever made it, because it took everything I had to move the wheel, and I didn't know what was going on. We're talking like one second, two seconds, and you know, you're doing 60 miles an hour, one second, you're down the road, headed towards the cliff. So, you know, the deep state is real, and I don't know why I have to tell you that story, but I told you that story. So the attack index, the oppression index, the enemy hates what we do because we expose the deception of the prince of the power of the air. And that's what we're going to do tonight. And this will stretch you, I promise you. It will definitely stretch you. So let's see what this has to do. Um, I'm not going to show that. Let's go UFO update because there's too much material to go on. The Christian community has a morbid propensity towards ambivalence in regard to the ongoing UFO phenomenon. There's this guy from a well-known ministry, and, and they're nationwide, and they're huge. It's a publishing house, and I'm not going to tell you which one, right? So I'm on the phone with this guy a couple of days ago, and I go, Josh, are you aware of what happened on Tucker Carlson? He goes, yeah, you know, LA, we've been following this here, and we're, we're, we're starting to get a little alarmed. I don't think we're ready for you yet, but we're, we're, we're kind of researching it. We're getting a little alarm. I go, Josh, I've written books about this for 20 years. I've been flailing my arms for 20 years. I've studied this thing since I was 16 years old. The Lord has raised me up for such a time as this. I mean, I'll give you the books for free. Let's get them out. Let's warn the people. So the Christian community has a morbid propensity towards ambivalence in regard to the ongoing UFO phenomenon. What I'm going to talk about tonight comes from this book, UFO Disclosure, the 70-year-old cover-up, and also the Watchman Chronicles. You see this guy, he's about to get sucked out of the window. So before I get into this, and I want to just see what happens, how many of you in the room have seen lights in the sky, UFOs, craft, um, had an encounter with an, an extraterrestrial or some entity, had sleep paralysis, raise your hand and hold them up. Hold them up high. Look around the room. Hold them up high and look around the room. Look around the room. See that? See that? And in most churches I go to, it can be as high as 35%. That's a guesstimate. I've been to churches and the pastor comes up to me afterwards and goes, I had no idea this was going on. Yeah, of course you don't. Because everybody's too ashamed and too freaked out and frightened to say anything about it because of all the ridicule and all the nonsense. Because they'll be immediately asked, where's your tinfoil hat? Mine burned in the fire, but when I had it, I wore it proudly. There's actually some YouTubes where you can see me take it on and put it on, and the audience just loves it. It's my tinfoil hat. I wear mine every day, and I love it, because this stuff is now starting to unravel, and those of us have been talking about this for decades. Where are we really? As I said last night, where are we? Who are you? What is this? No one, nobody has a flipping clue as to where we are and what this is in the universe. Nobody. Absolutely, Captain. Nobody. Oh, sorry, I just hit the table. <laughs> nobody has any idea if the if 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 the universe is analogous to the United, if the United States of America is analogous to um, the universe, are we in Duluth, Walla Walla, Tampa, Dallas? 
Oklahoma City, nobody has any idea of where we are in the universe. Nobody. And that should keep all of you up at night. But it doesn't, because we all drink the Kool-Aid, myself included. I've got to get up in the morning. Uh, the baby needs to get changed. I'm changing my job. I'm getting Social Security. My hair is falling out. I mean, whatever it is, right? And we just walk through this thing, and we just kind of, well, you know, whatever. We're somewhere floating around in this little blue ball. I don't know. Who cares, right? That's Give me a break. Nobody knows where it comes from, where we come from. The God of the Bible tells us exactly that Jesus spoke the word and we were all created. And nothing that was made without him was not made without him. Okay, I get that. Fine. That's great. He made, creates everything. He is our creator. I understand that. But everybody else, including us, we don't know really where all this began from. And the thing that really keeps you up at night, and I used to think this when I was like seven or eight years old. Okay. And I used to break out in a sweat. If there's nothing... Nothing can't be black or white. So what is it? If there's nothing, then there's nothing. But nothing, what is nothing? And I would sit there and try to think with my little stupid little brain, pea brain, and of course you can't. And if God is there, he was always there, well, where did he come from? And I know we've all thought about that stuff. And you just sit there and you go, ah, where's a hamburger, quick. Something to ground me again. The point being is nobody on this planet has any idea of where we are and what this is. And that really should keep you up at night. We know from the biblical prophetic narrative that at some point in time in the future, he rolls up the heavens like a scroll. Oh, that's just allegory. Oh, no one, God can't possibly do that? Who do you think he is? God or something? That's exactly who I think he is. And when he does that, he can do that. He can roll this whole stinking thing up like a scroll. He can create a whole new one. And guess what? I can't wait to see it when he does. I want a front row seat. Go, Jesus, go! Well, what did Mary think? That's a rabbit trail. But what, what was Mary? I mean, she's, you know, she just had to have been completely blown away because she knows this whole thing from the beginning. Nobody else does. Not even Joseph at that point. And Joseph's not around after a while. He just fades from the thing. So nobody knows where we are. You know, and I love his scientists. The Hubble telescope reported recently that there's <clears throat> another 5,000 planets which could have life on this, on, in the galaxy. So we now have, you know, they're always telling us that 5,000 planets somewhere in some galaxy out there which could possibly support life. Guess what? What if we're in a holographic universe? What if we're in a holographic universe? What if this is really only that the thing that there is? What if there's just planet Earth and that's it? Because the New Jerusalem comes to Earth. It doesn't go to Zeta Reticuli. Jesus comes to where? Here. He doesn't go somewhere else. It's here. The New Jerusalem comes here. Not to the moon, not to Mars, not to Saturn, not to Zeta Reticuli, not to Alpha Centauri. It comes to Earth. And he rolls from here. And then he rolls the thing up. I think this is it. And the reason for that is because these entities pop in and out. They manipulate space, time, matter, and energy that we don't know. We are in some sort of a holodeck. We are in literally some sort of a matrix, which is why I love that movie. We are in some sort of a matrix here. Is it real? Of course it's real. You know, you shoot me, I'm going to bleed. Please don't. We're having a raffle to see who will shoot L.A. <clears throat> for preaching heresy from the pulpit. The bottom line is this. Nobody knows where we are and what this is. But we have the biblical prophetic narrative which states, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which come on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now, does that sound like a real good, happy, happy Sunday morning sermon? Hey, guess what, folks? The powers of heaven are going to be shaken. So I suggest you stand up and shake your wallets out. No, I mean, I'm just joking. But you get what I'm saying? That's not a happy thought. Peter Pan can't fly with that. Trust me. It's not a happy thought. That's Jesus. So why is he warning us about all this stuff? Because he knows what's coming. He knows the beginning before the end and calls it out with great specificity because he is God. And he incarnated here and thank God by his blood that we shed on Calvary and by our belief in him, we are saved. If it was any more difficult, we humans couldn't possibly do it. Oh, uh, do you believe in Jesus? That he came and rose from the dead? Yeah, I guess so. That's about all we can do. Okay, I'm in. That's it. I'm a sinner. I got saved. That's it. That's all I know. And then the fun begins. And all of us in ministry and all of you out there, 
We all spend time on the anvil in the forge of the living God. When he heats us up, puts that on the anvil, and pounds the living daylights out of us and reshapes us. And at first, it is very, very painful. At first, we do not like it. It's like, ah! If this was a Christian, I had no idea what I was getting into, precisely. <laughs> they never tell you. <laughs> just come at Jesus, everything's going to be fine. And then you realize just how depraved and how deep the depravity goes and how the Lord just takes layer after layer after layer. And that's why, and everything, any, you know, my, in, in my flesh is no good thing. And the 24 elders are casting their crowns down. Jeez, I'm only on slide four or five. I got to get going here. They're, they're casting their crowns down. Why? Because they realize what he's done. He's delivered them. Amen. He's delivered them. And guess what? My spirit is, is reunited with him, but my flesh is still my flesh. And the two are at war with each other constantly, right? But at some point in time, in the not too distant future, when my body is ascended and I'm in my glorified body in a mortal, and I, let me tell you the story, okay? Here we go. LA will never get out of here and it's already almost 8 o'clock. We're in a heap of trouble. Can you guys stay late? Okay, I have to get up at 6 in the morning and leave, so I don't want to hear any whining, okay? Huh? It's actually more like 5 to leave by 6. So, you know, I, I never, people ask me, LA, what's your position on the rapture? Are you pre, mid, or post? And I go, it's, you know, I'm pan, it'll all pan out in the end. Yeah, yeah. And the only reason for that is we're told by Jesus, right, to destroy the works of the enemy, not to argue about when we get beamed out of here. So to me, it's like, okay, we can talk about that. You guys want to argue about it? Fine. Oh, it's, it's mid LA. I've, I've studied the scripture, and it's absolutely mid tribulation. No, we're here for the whole tribulation. I'm hunkering down with my AK 47. Ha! I dare you to come. And I shoot you for Jesus. I mean, it's like people have all these, all these crazy stuff, right? And I'm, I'm staunchly pre-trib. I'm out of here. You know, I'm out of here. But I never talk about it except for things like this because I'm about to lead into a story. So I'm, I'm getting ready to go in the shower. That's an vim- image you don't need to think. So I'm getting ready to go in the shower. And all of a sudden, as Paul would say, in the body or out of the body. I've been taken twice. Once, which I can't even talk about. That's a ride around the white horse. He won't go there. I'll be bit, bawling like a baby. But I was there for three seconds. This one... He takes me up, I'm there for three seconds. Second one, I'm standing in this great throng of people. We're not like this, brother, together. Hey, gee, what the heck happened? I don't know, where are you from? I don't know, we're not like that. There's like 15, 20 feet, there's space between people. We're all facing the same direction. There is a holy, reverential silence, holy, which permeates the atmosphere. No one's going, hey, what the heck just happened? That's not happening. It's totally holy. Everybody knows exactly where we are and what's just happened. The third second, I go like this. My sin nature's gone. I went, it was astounding. I experienced it for three seconds. And then I'm back in the room, and I just fell to my knees and wept because it was absolutely astounding. I was there. And the next question is, L.A., was it pre, mid, or post? <laughs> Just joking. I don't know. Just like the rider on the white horse. Okay, so men's hearts failing them for fear. Something is coming. Can you guys agree? Raise your hand. You guys agree on this? Good. Something's coming. Satan comes with all signs and lying wonders. Oh, gee, there's a great topic for a sermon. That'll make everybody feel good. Guess what, folks? Satan comes with all signs and lying wonders. Isn't that just wonderful? Doesn't that make you feel good? Right? Isn't that a feel-good message? There it is. It's in the Bible. When was the last time you heard a message on that? No one talks about this stuff. They're warnings. They're warnings for us that we need to take really, really seriously because we are in a window of time where this stuff is manifesting and manifesting like I've never seen it before. Jesus, even the elect would be deceived if that were possible. What about for those of you who are at Fatima, all those people in the field, weeping, yelling, screaming, oh, it's coming down on me, thank you, thank you. You know, clapping their hands at the apparitions and all this stuff. Even the elect would be deceived if that were possible. I'm not going to be deceived, God, God willing. I don't think any of you, after you see this stuff, and if you've been for all the presentations, you know, you're not going to be fooled by something like that. You're going to rebuke first and ask questions later. But that's a warning from Jesus, the strong delusion. And with every wicked deception directed against those who are perishing because they refuse the love of the truth. 
What's the truth? The truth is that Yeshua, Jesus, created everything from his mouth. He made everything. And without him, nothing that was made was, that was not made. That was it. Everything came through Jesus. That is the truth. He is the creator. He did create us, created all life on this planet, created everything that we see, created the universe. That's where it all came from. He spoke it into existence. For this reason, because he refused the love of the truth, and because we have Darwinism, that's the refusing the love of the truth. They don't believe that God created anything. In fact, they don't believe in God at all. So Darwinism has usurped the God of the Bible. And so God says, fine, believe the lie. So for this reason, because they abandon and refuse the love of the truth, a powerful delusion is sent to them so that they will believe the lie. He's calling it out with great specificity. What is the lie? This is the lie right here. This is the lie. Why aren't you going down? Oh, there we go. Hold on. Let me go back. It started to move. There we go. That's the lie. There we go. That somehow, millions and millions of years ago, some chimpanzee got the bright idea to stand up and start speaking in a crisp English accent. <laughs> I say. How long have we been here anyway? I mean, it's such nonsense. Why, and I said last night, just show me one thing. Just show me one thing which is evolving. Something growing a flipper or feathers or whatever. Becoming something else. It doesn't exist. Because the DNA, comp the complexity of the DNA, the, the spiral of life, the deoxyribonucleic acid, the double helix of life, the DNA molecular structure is a complex code. So everything is created and reproduces according to its kind. That's the way it works. Just exactly what Genesis. No one had to go any further than that. Everything reproduces according to its kind. Hummingbirds beget hummingbirds. They don't beget kangaroos. And on and on it goes. Because of the complexity of the DNA. So the whole lie is the Darwinian evolution. But the neo-Darwinists are looking at the stars as they realize the complexity of a DNA code, which is the building block of all life on this planet, could not have originated on its own. Thus, many of the neo-Darwinists believe all life was seeded here by an advanced race of extraterrestrials. This is from um, this year. Comets and asteroids may be spreading life across the galaxy. Beep, 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 beep. Alert, may be spreading life across the, the galaxy. That, that concept is called panspermia. What we see here on the ancient aliens, why aren't you working? There it goes. What we see here on the ancient aliens thing, every Friday, uh, ancient astronaut theorists believe that we were visited before. That's all they say over and over and over. Ancient astronaut theorists say yes, you know. Can penguins fly? Ancient astronaut theorists say yes. I mean, no matter what it is, the ancient astronaut theorists, the people on uh, the History Channel's Ancient Aliens, and I was on the first two seasons, by the way, of that, and, and was talked about that, they say we were created by these guys. They say we, that we were seated here. The idea of that is called panspermia, because they know that the complexities of DNA are there, but God of the Bible is no good for them, so they look out to the universe. This is what the, the neo darwinists is, because there is no supernatural. So nothing can just spring into being, like when Jesus blesses the food and all of a sudden he feeds the 5,000. That doesn't work for them. That can't possibly happen for them. But that's what our Bibles tell us, that Moses, you know, holds up his staff or drops his staff, whatever he does to his staff, and the waters come up as a heap, that Jesus walks on the water. And by the way, he's always bumping up. There's no humor in the Bible. Are you kidding me? Seriously. So the disciples, he goes, hey, you guys get in the boats. I'll catch up with you later. What's the first thing that's wrong with this picture? And the disciples are going, uh, how's he going to catch up with us later? They're kind of going like, this isn't going to work. They're out there, and it's, we all know the story. And so, you know, the gentle Jesus that we get in, high, in, 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 our, in our, some of our Bible studies with the lamb on his shoulders, the white guy with the lamb on the shoulders, you know, that guy, he would be going, hey guys, it's me, Jesus. It's kind of light, it's getting dark. I'm walking to you on the water. Don't be afraid, it's just me. But he doesn't do that, does he? He goes walking by. The ghost, the ghost, the ghost. They all totally freak out. Oh, that's not deliberate? What about after the crucifixion? The disciples are huddled up in the upper room. Who's next? I could be next. They're coming for me. I'm leaving Dodge in the morning. I can't stand this anymore. I got to get out of here. Call Jim. So they're like, they're huddled in the upper room. The gentle Jesus would have done this. Watch your hearing aid. Hey guys, it's me. It's Jesus. I'm going to come through the door now. Please don't be afraid or frightened. No. Ta-da! 
He pops through the wall. Ah! They totally freak out. But there's no humor in the Bible. Hey, Peter. Peter comes, oh, Jesus, I'm really getting bugged by my wife. We've got to go pay the taxes. I don't have any money. I've been following you around. We have been fishing. Oh, my God, the bills are buying up. My wife is nagging me. I don't know what to do. The kids need new sandals for school, some parchments. I mean, no. So what does he tell him? Jesus, he goes, Peter, go out and cast your line on the water, Peter. And the first fish that you get, take the gold coin out of it. Are you out of your mind? Are you, what are you smoking, Jesus? Come on. What's going on here? Right? I mean, it's absolutely crazy. So what do you think Peter does? Oh, the Lord has just told me to go down to the water and I'm going to go do it because, you know, I have faith like a mustard seed. Nonsense. Peter might have gone to John or one of the other apostles and going to go, you're not going to believe this one. Okay? Master just told me to go down and catch a fish and get the gold coins out of his mouth. I mean, what do you think? And they're going, well, you know, we better do it because of all the other stuff. So they go down there. He throws his line out. You can just see it. They're sitting there waiting. You know, is it, any, any nibbles? No nibbles. How about now? Not yet. Shh. All of a sudden, you know, the bobber, of course, they don't have bobbers, but whatever. The cork goes ding, 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 and they pull the fish out. Now, at this point, what do you think they're doing? Open this mouth. No, you open it. Let me have this. My fish. So they open the mouth. There's the gold coin. Now, what do you think they do? Oh, Father, oh, Lord in heaven, thank you for your provision, Father. You are, no! They're going, oh, my gosh, I can't believe it! Are there any more out there? They're totally freaked out. They're jumping around, they're laughing. They can't believe it. Gold coins out of a fish. That's the God we serve. Now, there's no humor in the Bible. UFO, you can turn the volume off on this. This is real from Mexico. Ay, se mueve mucho la cámara. No le veo ningún hilo. ¿Te va a pasar un avión? ¿Te va a pasar un avión? ¿Va en la ruta del avión? This clip came from Jaime Mazón, and we were allowed to use it in, in their own words. Necesito tenerlo en un lugar fijo porque cuando hago el acercamiento. Steady, steady. There you go, big fella. Qué carajo se la hizo. Okay, next slide. This is Tucker Carlson. I'm going to let you watch it. I will not comment it. I won't say a word. After that, we'll, st we'll tear it apart. Here we go. Volume. UFOs have been the stuff of conspiracy theorists for decades, often mocked for talking about it, but maybe they shouldn't be mocked. Commander David Fravers spent 18 years as a naval aviator and pilot. In 2004, he had an unforgettable encounter with an aircraft he said was defying the laws of physics. Former Commander Fravor joins us tonight. Thanks a lot for coming on tonight. Um, t tell us, tell us what you saw. Well, we were on a, uh, we had launched on a routine training mission. Uh, when we joined up, we were told that the event was going to be canceled, and that we have real world tasking, and we were sent out to the west. Now, take in mind that this has taken place about 100 miles southwest of San Diego, between San Diego and Ensenada, Mexico. Yeah. Uh, on a clear, perfect day, blue waters. We get out to the spot where they tell us it's at. Um, we start looking around, and both of us, both airplanes, see a disturbance in the water and a white 40-foot long tic-tac-shaped tic object just hovering above the water, going forward, back, left, right. There's no rotor wash. There's no wings, nothing. So as we drive around in a clockwise flow, we get to about the 9 o'clock position, and I said, well, I'm going to go down and check it out, and the other jet is going to stay high. So as we go down, at, when we get to the 12 o'clock position, it starts to mirror us. So it's in a clockwise flow, and it's on the opposite side of the circle from us. And we continue this. It's in a climb. We're in a descent. We're getting a great look at it. This whole thing takes about probably up to five minutes from the time we show up. I get over to the 8 o'clock position. It's at about the 2 o'clock position. And I decide I'm going to go and see what it is, and it's about 2,000 feet below me. And I cut across the circle, and as I get within about a half mile of it, it rapidly accelerates to the south in about two seconds and disappears. What, what would you estimate the speed? Oh, well above supersonic. It, it like a bullet out of a gun, it took off. So from what you know about aerodynamics, mechanics, physics, uh, should this be possible, what you saw? Not with the technology that we have today. Not, not at all. Even now, even 13 years later, is there anything that you know of capable of this kind of behavior? 
No, there's nothing I know of. I mean, this when you look when we saw the the video with the IR, it has no exhaust. Uh, it you know no no discernible things of anything form of propulsion, and this thing came from a dead hover over the water, just kind of moving around to a climb up to about 12,000 feet to rapidly accelerating away in a climb, and in less than two seconds it was gone. And you figure you're talking 50 miles of visibility, and you can easily see an object that size easily out to 10 miles, and it just disappeared in seconds. Could, I mean, what would be the effects on a human pilot of the G-forces involved in that altitude change? Uh, well, the altitude wouldn't be bad. It would be the acceleration of the object. That's what it, right. Um, the, well, I, honestly, I wanted to fly it. <laughs> yeah, but, I bet. Uh, uh, you know, there's, you know, talking to some physicists, they don't think the human body could handle that kind of force with that yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't sound, it doesn't sound like the human body could. So bottom line, what do you think this was? I believe, as do the other folks that were on the flight that we, when we visually saw it, that it was something not from this world. I believe, as do the other folks that were on the flight that we, when we visually saw it, that it was something not from this world. I believe, as do the other folks that were on the flight that we, when we visually saw it, that it was something not from this world. When presumably you expressed that belief to your superiors, what did they say? Well, actually, we, we caught a lot of grief getting back to the boat, uh, it, and it got passed off as an event that no one could explain. Now, keep in mind, they had been tracking these for two weeks prior to us seeing it, and this was the first time that manned airplanes had been airborne uh, when the objects appeared. This feels like a really big story to me. I, I'm not, it's not exactly clear why Vladimir Putin's more interesting than this. I think this seems like a big deal. And Commander, I appreciate the time that manned airplanes had been airborne. Turn the lights back up. I want to walk through this real quickly. So on national TV, Commander David Fravor, who was an unknown, no one knows who this guy is. He doesn't have a book, doesn't have a DVD for sale. He's an unknown entity, okay? So why, are we, why, are, why aren't you guys seeing what I'm seeing here? There you go, thank you. So if you look at this, it's a triptych. You got Tucker Carlson on the left, Fravor um, in the center, and to the right, you have classified UFO footage. So the question is, who calls up whom and goes, yeah, we'd like to bring this guy David Fravor on Tucker Carlson's show next Tuesday. Well, who's David Fravor? Oh, he's just an unknown. Oh, and by the way, we've got classified UFO footage, which we want to show on, on, your, on your Tucker Carlson primetime and nobody bats an eyelash. This is managed. You have to understand that this is a managed event, a managed event by the deep state is essentially who's doing it. And it's a, it's a test balloon to see how the American people would react. And as I said last night, <coughs> flatlined. No one reacts at all. Eh, who cares? Oh look, there's a UFO, ah, we've seen those on YouTube. Nobody reacts, nobody says anything. The church doesn't do anything with it, nobody says anything. Since then, 2017 of December, the US government admitted that Area 51 existed. They admitted that they study UFOs. How the heck, how, well, how do they study UFOs? What do they do, trade black and white pictures from the 50s? I mean, <laughs> how, do they, how do they study UFOs? So it, it's, it's deep, it's wacky. And since then, about every four to six weeks, sometimes sooner, than that, or more frequent than that, I should say. Tucker Carlson has another guest on his show talking about UFOs. And here's just another another shot, of basically the same right, thing. Yes. Former Nevada Senator Harry Reid thinks it might be time to hold congressional hearings into the mystery surrounding UFOs. In his only television interview, Reid told the I-Team about the pivotal role that he played in authorizing a secret Pentagon study of UFOs that ended five years ago. The project was based here in Nevada, carried out by a Las Vegas businessman who is no stranger to paranormal investigations. So this is, this is, we can turn the lights back on. So this is what these, these talking heads who are reading off teleprompters, uh, by the way, they don't do anything but read off teleprompters. They're just sitting there going, well, how are you reading the blah, 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 the UFOs? But that's disclosure. That's disclosure. And they're talking about secret government programs. They're talking about Harry Reid had headed this thing up. That's disclosure. And it's, you know, 
all these guys do that you saw, they, they like that there's some authority, they're newscasters that read off a teleprompter. They don't go out and dig up their stories, they don't vet any of the stories, for the most part. Some do, most don't. They just show up at work, they read the teleprompter, they get their check, and everybody trusts them. And the media sometimes will have on all local news, news channels, across, and we've done this whole thing. One of the things a couple years ago, it was hysterical. Um, I think it was on, was it on Letterman? No, it was, um, it was on Conan. Conan. And, he, and it was a clip they compiled of all these local news stations. And one guy would come up and go, you don't need us to tell you gas prices are on the rise. Cut to some lady someplace else in another part of the United States saying exactly the same thing. You don't need us to tell you gas prices are on the rise. Cut to another, they did this about 12 to 15 times. You don't need us to tell you gas prices are on the rise. Everybody's saying the same thing. That's not news. That's propaganda. That's conditioning. Welcome to where we are. Welcome to where we are. The government admits it studies UFOs, so about those Area 1, Area 51 conspiracies. Um, this is from the UK. Check this out. Sorry. later, uh, Tucker Carlson had this gentleman on, former Pentagon official, no one wants to risk their careers talking about UFOs. You say these things are happening right. over the past 20 years. How many, roughly, would you say, credible sightings there have been by the U.S. military? Yeah, it's hard to say over the last 20 years, and there's a difference. And one of the differences is that we're deploying much more capable sensors that provide a higher degree of fidelity. So whereas 15 years ago, we might get pilot reports saying, I saw a bright light out there. Now we're right. getting reports from an Aegis-class cruiser that says this thing came down from 80,000 feet, descended to 20,000 feet, dropped to 50 feet and hovered, then maneuvered towards the carrier, and then pilots are independently seeing it and confirming it and filming it. So Ms. it's Mr. a Mel, very we're different... We're out of time. I hope this tape okay. goes everywhere. Thank you for your bravery. Former Pentagon officials call for big UFO reveal after secret investigation. The <clears throat> U.S. government recovered materials from unidentified flying object it does not recognize. Astronaut claims he witnessed an organic alien-like creature, but NASA is denying it. NASA, by the way, sta stands for never a straight answer. <laughs> Google Earth blind spot over experimental, experimental military base Maybe where UF government hides crashed UFOs, Defense Insider claims. The Space Force, President Trump's talking about the Space Force. So, all that to get up to this. This is two weeks ago, Tucker Carlson. So I'm writing about all this. I'm flailing my arms, trying to wake up a sleeping church and anybody else who will listen. For the most part, people are very ambivalent. They don't really care. No matter how much information you throw at them, well... But this one, two weeks ago, whenever it was, this is the game changer. Because this guy, Luis Elizondo, um, is now on Tucker Carlson, prime time. And Tucker Carlson asks a very direct question. And we talked about this last night. Here's the clip. Well, for many, many decades, the U.S. government has dismissed out of hand UFO sightings as crank stuff, things that lunatics babble about. Now, suddenly they're taking a different approach. They are telling the truth. They're finally admitting that UFO sightings are, in fact, routine, and the government is now being systematic in investigating the question of UFOs. A new History Channel documentary called Unidentified will explore the military's many recent encounters with unidentified aircraft. The object the Navy pilot is tracking suddenly seems to get bigger. The object then appears to accelerate rapidly, disappearing off screen. That's a significant rate of acceleration in a horizontal plane off to the left. That's very fast. The object appears to perform a similar maneuver to what the pilots witnessed. 
Instantaneous acceleration at this rate would produce a force of gravity, or G-force, so extreme it would crush a human being. Luis Elizondo is a former military intelligence official and special agent in charge. He joins us tonight. Luis, thanks very much for coming on. Thank you, Tucker, for having me. So um, the military has decided to stop lying about this. I guess the first question is, why did they lie for so many years about what they knew? I think that's a fair question, Tucker. I think there could be multiple answers. I think, first and foremost, um, let's look at the obvious. We didn't have quite the technology for decades that we do now. We now have the, the technology on some of the most sophisticated weapon systems that give us the fidelity that we need to, to better ascertain what these things are. Another answer could possibly be, frankly, stigma and taboo, and that this is a topic that is, right. that is fraught with these landmines, potential, you know, if you will, proverbial landmines. Yeah, I mean, we sent a man to the moon 50 years ago, so we, we've, had, we've had technology for a while, and in fact, it's been more than 60 years uh, that the, since right after the Second World War that the U.S. military has been downplaying these reports. So over the course of that time, some of the smartest, most dedicated people in our country watching these unexplained aerial phenomenon, they must have gathered quite a bit of information about UFOs. What have they learned, do you think, in all these decades? Well, Tucker, I, I can only answer from, from the time that I was with ATIP for about 10 years when I was, when I was part of that program, and we learned a lot. Um, I think probably the most significant, if you will, results of the program were five observables, and you've already mentioned a few of them on your show, and that's instantaneous acceleration, hypersonic velocities, a bit of a, 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 an oxymoron, but low observability, uh, transmedium travel, and last but not least, positive lift or, in the vernacular, anti-gravity. So, I mean, there have been enough sightings over a long enough period that the idea that this is a computer glitch <laughs> or that, the, that these are generated somehow by radar systems, that can't be right, correct? Uh, Tucker, we are, we are well beyond right now establishing whether or not these, these things exist. It is an absolute fact that they are there. Now, what they are, where they're from, who's behind the wheel, we, we simply don't know. I mean, is it possible these things are a foreign adversarial technology that somehow was developed in secret and we're just now trying to figure these things out? It's possible, but there's also other possibilities as well of what these things could be. Right. So uh, that, th I mean, that would be the, the terrestrial explanation. Just to sign off the top of your head a likelihood of that being the case that these are uh, Russian and Chinese. You know, Tucker, you, you don't want me to give my opinion. I, I, the one thing I learned in intelligence, there's a lot... I, you can be absolutely sure of something and be absolutely wrong. Of course. And so I, it's happened to me many times. You know, I, but it I, sounds, I, I guess just to, just to sort of put a bow on it, it I think sounds it's a low to probability. me I think that's it's, it. Okay. It's it a very low, like a probability. low probability. That, look, we, we have the most sophisticated weapon systems right now on the face of the planet. And we can identify not only a 737 or a MiG-25 or a F-22, we can tell you even what airline it is uh, and, and the difference between the models of aircraft within that type of aircraft. So... I think it's highly unlikely that a foreign adversary was successful right. in developing something like this. So let me ask you one last question. Do you believe, based on your decade of, of serving in the U.S. government on, on this question, that the U.S. government has in its possession any material from one of these aircrafts? Ooh, uh, I, I do, yes. You think the U.S. government has debris from a UFO in its possession right I, now? Unfortunately, Tucker, I, I really have to be careful of my NDA. I really can't go into a lot of more detail than that. Okay. But uh, simply put, yes. All right. Well, we have a lot more to find out. And uh, I'm glad, very much, very glad that you came on our show tonight. And I hope Thank you come you back. For Basically, what he did is he just broke his NDA. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Why did he do that on national TV? Because he was told to. He's part of the plan. How does he get on Tucker Carlson? Why does Tucker Carlson lob that softball question and ask it to him twice? Do you think the United States, they weren't talking about that. Out of the blue, Tucker says, let me ask you this, to put a bow on it, you know? Well, do you, does the United States government have debris from a crash UFO in their possession? And he says, yes. He asks it again to make sure we all get it. And he says, yes. So I can't say any more than that. We should all just go home. <laughs> but there's so much more because the great deception is upon us it's being unraveled by the deep state the deep state in my opinion are luciferian and that's a three hour conversation 
and they're, they're being pushed and fueled by entities, nefarious entities, nefarious interdimensional entities, i.e. fallen angels. That's what we're looking at, posing as extraterrestrials. They have one goal, to create a one world government, a one world system, just like the Bible tells us, to mark every person on this, on this planet, to make them worship the beast. They always want to be worshiped. That's the end game. And we are rapidly heading towards that. And the fact that this closure happened on Tucker Carlson and the church dithers is real, incredibly alarming to me. Incredibly alarming to me. Because it shows me that the church, for the most part, now I'm here at this church, so that tells you something about your pastor. Other places, not so much. And there's a lot of pastors in the audience, which tells me, that it gives me hope that people are starting to wake up. Because what's coming, it's going to be really crazy. I think the church is out of here. But how much will we see before we get taken up? And that I can't answer. I don't know. We're already seeing stuff that we never would have imagined 25 years ago. You know, Boudigay kissing his husband on, on, uh, on the stage and everybody applauding like this is the great thing. Gay marriage, the law of the land. You know, people fighting over abortion like, like it's just insane. Boycott Alabama because they're backwards and, you know, no, we can't kill the babies. What's wrong with you people? This is where we are. So these testimonies are from uh, the book and also the DVD, and they are alarming. The wife of someone who was well-known in Christian circles came up to me at a conference years ago. Um, we'll call her Beth, and, which is not her real name. Once again, we have a troubling story of someone who is a Christian and who has been abducted. Most folks don't want to hear that this can happen, but the reality is this. It is happening. We need to come together, deal with it, and perhaps try to find an answer as to why. Beth has not even told her account of her abduction, which resulted in missing time to her husband, but she told me. Beth and a friend were driving through New Mexico at night. They were on a stretch of road that didn't have a lot of traffic on it. Suddenly, the entire car was enveloped in a very bright, blinding light. That's all Beth remembers. She then recalls that she and her friend awakened hundreds of miles from where they should have been, and when looking at their car's clock, realized that they had lost four hours of time. When Beth told me her story, she broke down in tears. She was emotionally distraught and kept asking me why this has happened. I didn't have an answer for her, and why it has been years since I heard her story, I find myself still without an answer. I asked Beth if her friend was Christian at the time of the incident, and she informed me that she was. I asked if she had dabbled in the occult or was involved in anything that could open a door. Beth replied that she hadn't been involved in anything that might have compromised her as a Christian. Her account, like Bernie's, is, a very, is very troublesome. She didn't even have a chance to rebuke first and ask questions later. I often, like I often admonish people who see things in the sky to do. Her car was bathed in light, she blacked out, and when she awakened, it was hours later, and she was hundreds of miles from where she was the last time she remembered. A few years back, a gentleman tried to get me to share my story with you, but I didn't feel it was right. I would like to now share my experience I had because I can see the great deception people are falling under. About 40 years ago, long before aliens and the greys had become a common conversation, I was at home with my two children. I had put them to bed, and then I went to bed in the middle of the night, I awakened with something holding my ankles at the end of my bed and two large black shadows with eyes and they were holding my ankles. It was like my bed area was lit up. It was like my bed area was lit up and to the right of me I saw this little gray thing about three feet tall with these funny clawed hands and the almond shaped eyes. It began to try to climb up on my bed and get on top of me. Instead of being frightened, the Holy Spirit in me rose up and I began to laugh at it and I rebuked it in the name of Jesus and all of it left. The dark shadow people, the alien, disappeared instantly. The Walsh's abductions. The Walsh's are an elderly couple who have been involved in full-time ministry for decades. The trouble is they have a secret that no one knows about. I was contacted by another researcher with this story years ago and it has remained in my mind ever since. I have discussed this with other Christian UFO researchers and there are no stock answers for what happened to the Walsh's. Both the husband and wife have been lifelong abductees. They have been taken numerous times on board the craft. They, try, they have tried to stop the abductions by rebuking the aliens in the name of Jesus, but this doesn't seem to help. The wife told us that her husband wakes up screaming most nights. She recounted to us that as a little girl, she remembers her whole family being taken as well as their neighbors. She stated that they all went out the front door of their houses and across the street to where the UFO was waiting for them in the field. The Walshes are exhausted, as this has been going on for years. Their experiences are real, 
and very troubling. Another dynamic is your children were also abducted when they were very young. The children are now young adults and have not been able to follow up to see if they are still being taken. The Walshers are tormented people who live in fear. They came to the researcher who contacted me looking for answers, but all he and I have is questions. Was the pact made in the far distant past, perhaps by another family member, which gave these entities legal right to take them? How is it that both the husband and wife are lifelong abductees? Was their marriage arranged somehow? The fact that the children were also abducted tells me that this is generational. Perhaps most disturbing of all was why the name of Jesus didn't stop these entities. Why is this happening now? This is, this is a theory. I can't prove it. But based on all my research with the occult, with the ancient world, the way things work with Luciferian sacrifice, which bloodletting and everything else that happened in antiquity, this is what's happening again in modernity. But it's now it's cleaned up with little guys in, in white suits and who, who call themselves doctors. The sightings are at an all-time high. We are living in an unprecedented time in the history of the world. Some of these pictures will be incredibly graphic, as I stated last night. We are living in an unprecedented time in the history of the world. World. There are now 1.5 billion, with a B, 1.5 billion abortions since Roe v. Wade. That basically eradicates everyone in North, Central, and South America. Goodbye. In other words, all those people in these, in these countries, there wouldn't be anyone. That's what 1.5 billion people look like. There's 300 million in the United States. Give you an idea of what we're up against here? 1.5 billion. If we think for one stinking second that this has not changed the supernatural atmosphere, we don't know anything. We need to go back in our Bibles and read the Old Testament and bloodletting and, and, and what happened in Ezekiel 8 when Father God takes Ezekiel into the temple and shows him the detestable things that are happening to the temple, in the temple. And Ezekiel's shocked. The same detestable things are happening in this country and, and now global. Abortion is just being used everywhere. We're starting to push back. Hallelujah. There are states now like, like Alabama I mean, I know Missouri only has one clinic left. Hallelujah. But then there's other states like New York who are saying, even if the infant's born alive after the abortion, kill it. Kill it. And I, I wrote a blog, and I was on Acceleration Radio, my show, and I said, okay, let's walk through this. Let's bring a woman who wants the abortion, and she's like eight months pregnant, right? And we'll abort the baby in front of Congress. And then we'll lay that baby who's born alive on the table and say, okay, guys, come up and kill it. Who wants to do that? How can you possibly defend it? And of course you can't. And it's time for the church to wake up and push back because it's supernatural. We are opening the gates of hell with this heinous practice. And you get this, my body, my choice. How about your choice before you get pregnant? How about that choice? For both the guy and the girl. And you know what? You can't legislate morality. But if someone, if a woman gets pregnant like that out of, out of, you know, and they don't want to have the baby and all this other stuff, I mean, this isn't, instead of t in teaching abstinence in the schools, see we had all fits together? What do we teach? Anything goes. Their classes in masturbation. Their classes in, in anal sex. <gasps> I mean, I'm just telling you what's going on. And all of, some of you, oh, I can't, can't believe you said that word from the pulpit. Oh, my gosh. We, it's all everywhere. We're surrounded by it. And it's glorified for crying out loud. It's glorified. We need to talk about it and understand that we need to push back and stand up and say, no, I really want to bang the table. Hold on, I'll move this over here. No, we won't do this. Sometimes you have to bang the table. The next couple of pictures are pretty intense. I show them on my program and amazingly, YouTube did not censor me. The life is in the blood. The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Cain and Abel, it's the first murder. Who, who is the father of lies? Who was the murderer from the beginning? Satan, the dragon. That's all he ever does. He lies, he kills, and he destroys. That's his MO. That's his calling card. 1.5 billion abortions since Roe v. Wade. The spiritual implications are staggering. So as I said last night, this pathologist talked about baby puzzles, and this is what she got. These are her photographs. And that's what that's you're looking at, the little arm, the little hand. That's graphic. That's absolutely graphic. 
And there were lots of these, and they had to put them together. And so these next couple of pictures, if you don't want to look, don't look, please, because they're very extremely graphic. The only reason why I show them is people need to understand what happens during an abortion. The child is literally pulled apart in a mother's womb. The child is pulled apart in the mother's womb. Are we living under a brass heaven? You bet. The picture I showed right here, that's one of the less graphic ones. <coughs> but there it is. And now the fetal tissue is being, being pulled, you know, being sold in the market. We are in an unprecedented time in history. Is there a connection between the 1.5? And by the way, when you rip apart a child in the mother's womb, blood's all over the place. They don't tell you that. You know, oh, don't show what the baby looks like when we do this stuff. Oh my gosh, people might change their mind. That's the whole point. That's why they don't show it, to keep everybody ignorant. It's, Hitler would have loved it. This is like right out of Hell's Kitchen. Right out of Hell's Kitchen. And when you see it, and you know it's life, how can you possibly defend ripping apart the child in the mother's womb? It's insanity. It is complete. And these women with the pink hats running around, my body, my choice, they're crazy. They're absolutely lunatics. They've lost their minds. They don't understand. Show them that picture. Defend that. I dare you to defend it. You can't. It's indefensible. You can't possibly defend that position. Why do I bring this up? Because that has changed the atmosphere that we live under. We are under a brass heaven. We have given fuel to the fires of hell, to the abortion holocaust, and because of that, everything is manifesting like we've never seen it before. And it's all across the board. It's lawlessness on steroids, and it's everywhere. Lawlessness reigns. Good is called evil. Evil is called good. Exactly like the biblical prophetic narrative warns us and tells us will happen in the last days. Folks, we are here. And the whole point of this talk is not only to arm you for the last four days about all the deception in the mounds and Lucifer and stuff. So we started in the mounds, right? And then we wind up with Fatima, which is the precursor to this. That jump starts all of this where we're going. That was 100, 102 years ago. And that, that changed everybody. Let's go to Fatima and burn some candles. And they burn thousands of candles every day. And there's so many people with candles. It's this big oven thing, and they just throw all the candles in there. And it's, the place smells of wax. It's just bizarre. People have drunk the Kool-Aid. But we're so far down the rabbit hole now, there is no turning back except for one thing, the return of the king. So when you see these things happen, Jesus' words, when you see the wars and rumors of wars, when you see the famines, when you see the pestilence, when you see all the lawlessness, the troublesome times, build a bunker, get your AK-47, stock up on food, hunker down, shoot someone for Jesus. No! Look up! Look up because he's coming back! Look up! because he's coming back. Herald the return of the king. Herald the return of the king. Jesus, he's coming back. He's coming back. He's got to come back because you can't fix this. You can't fix this anymore. 15 years ago, you could fix it maybe. Now, forget it. How many people think we're better off in 2019 than we were in, in 1999? Anyone in the room, raise your hand, please. <laughs> it's just so you know, everywhere I go, I ask that question, I have never seen one hand go up. Why is that? Because everyone sitting in this room, whether you can articulate it or not, you know viscerally, instinctively, that something is really wrong and it ain't getting any better no matter who's in the Oval Office. In fact, it seems like it gets worse every single day. And I'm not a pessimist. I'm not. I'm a total optimist. I believe in, I, I pray for goodness over my house, over my wife, over my family, over our ministry. I pray that every day. The goodness of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord over this congregation, over your pastor, the goodness of the Lord over this building, over everyone who walks here. They may feel the peace and the goodness of the Lord. That's positive. But we are living in the most troublesome times on the history of the planet, maybe except for Noah's flood. And what does Jesus warn us about? It'll be like the days of Noah when I return. And what differentiates the days of Noah from any other time in the history? The presence of fallen angels of the Nephilim and the B'nai Ho'elim. That's what's on the planet. The whole place is nuts and he's got to destroy it with a flood because the genome is completely contaminated. And unless he destroys it, right, everything will be lost. And the, the Redeemer will never come. This is hardball. It is hardball. And we are in a window of time that is unprecedented. Humanity, this is Luis Elizondo, humanity is approaching a very dangerous and very important time in its collective development. He's not a Christian, by the way. You are on the verge of emerging into a greater community of intelligent life. Oh, really? He says, who, Luis? 
You will be encountering other races of beings who are coming to your world seeking to protect their interests and to discover what opportunities may lie ahead. They are not angels or angelic beings. They are not spiritual entities. They are beings who are coming to your world for resources, for alliances, and to gain an advantage in an emerging world. They are not evil. They are not holy in that they are also much like you. They are simply driven by their needs, their associations, their beliefs, and their collective goals. You know, Mr. Elizondo, with all due respect, it appears like you've been reading my blog and perhaps even my books, and that you deliberately said that to di discount and move people away from what I constantly talk about. They are evil. They are not from Zeta Reticuli. They are interdimensional entities. They can manipulate space, time, matter, and energy in ways that completely defy our physics. They are nefarious interdimensional entities that have one goal, to deceive all mankind and to be worshipped. That's their goal. And they are well on their way to advancing their agenda. Hello. Just watch what he says here. Um, but I think the same time next year we're going to have a fundamentally different conversation. I think, I think disclosure already occurred. I don't think necessarily disclosure is an event. I think it's a process. And I think that process began. With that said, I'd like to go ahead and start with a presentation. I think when this first came out, everybody was... And, and all of a sudden, Luis Elizondo is everywhere. How does that happen? The guy hasn't written a book that I'm aware of. He's got no DVDs like we have out there. All of a sudden, Luis Elizondo is everywhere on Tucker Carlson. How does that work? Who calls up? Hey, put Elizondo on. We want to go to the next rung of a ladder and see what the American people will do. Uh, Mr. Elizondo, does the American government have crashed UFO debris in their possession? Yes, on national TV. The church? Eh. What is it going to take? And I warned about this six months ago, a year ago. I said, you watch, you mark my words, you can go back and read it in the blog. The next rung on the ladder, the next thing that they will roll out, they'll bring somebody, maybe a retired general, and they're going to talk about the crash debris. They're going to have pictures. Well, there were no pictures, but he said yes. It was very close to what I said, not exactly, because I'm not a prophet. It was not from God, it was just speculation. But it's close. And I predict, and Gary Stearman and I had a conversation on this a couple, couple of weeks ago, watch for the pictures, watch for the video. Because that, that is going to be the third rung on the ladder before full-blown disclosure. That's the next thing. And let's see what the church does. Let's see what you do. People, wow, did you see the alien? It looked, it looked just like the guy in Star Wars. That's really cool. I want to meet him. We've all been conditioned. In the, in the book, uh, UFOs, 70 Years Disclosure, the newest book, there's a section in it, and some people go, oh, you're just, that's all filler. Why, why did you do that? Because I wanted to show the reader film after film after TV show that deals with close encounters. We have been conditioned. And then guess what? The conditioning has worked really well. Because the second run of a ladder has been breached, and no one says anything. Oh, yeah, we know about that. UFOs, yeah, I, I know they were real. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, water. Watch this one. United 367, preparing for takeoff. Please advise. Copy that, 367. Stand by. What is it? One of the brightest students I have ever had. And you are failing my class. Do you hear about this? Flight operations were temporarily suspended this afternoon after reports of a mysterious aircraft hovering above the airport. I'm going to need the footage from this entire facility. I want all those passengers in conference room A. We now believe that it was a small drone. No way. It's way bigger. When I was a kid, I saw something. These lights outside. It wasn't a drone. The guy on TV was lying. You don't automatically jump to the most extreme explanation. This isn't some textbook problem. This is more complicated than anything you've ever seen before. This terminal is crawling with federal agents. Why would they still be here if they figured out what it was? We need to shut him down. The FBI is monitoring our computers. Why didn't I see this before? Think it's some sort of signal? That's binary. 
They're using math as a way to communicate. And if I'm right, he's coming back. There's an opportunity to take a giant leap forward. Everything is riding on it. What are the most important questions in the world? Is there a God? What happens when we die? Are we alone in the universe? If anyone answered any one of those questions, it would change everything. So the deep state cover up with Roswell, um, there was uh, some well-meaning Christian guys who um, have written books about this stuff and they insist that Roswell was not real and that nothing crashed, it was a weather balloon. The guy on the left here is uh, Jesse Marcel Sr. And this man here is uh, uh, Jesse Marcel Jr. And we've got two witnesses here that claimed, especially Sr., that he handled the wreckage of a downed UFO. And what happened was, is he brought the wreckage back to his wife and son before the Air Force Base, before he took it there. And he laid it out on the kitchen table and he said, look at this, cause this is something that you'll probably never see again. It's not from this world. And Jesse Marcel Jr. handled the wreckage. Both of them went to their graves insisting that this happened. They never retracted their story. I interviewed Jesse Marcel Jr. and that interview is actually in, in the book. I have this, uh, a reproduction of this paper on the wall in my studio. So the bottom line is, is that the, the, what, they, what they say is that it was a weather balloon. Dr. Jesse Marcel Sr. was the base intelligence officer. To think for a second that he would mistake a weather balloon for a down UFO is an absolute insult to the man's intelligence. He lived around with these things constantly. This is a cover story. <coughs> Colonel Hill, and I, I, we're kind of running out of time here. <coughs> There's so much more I want to get into. So I'm going to just tell you what happens here. It's from the film in their own words. These people um, work with end of life patients. And there was a man that they met by the name of Colonel Hill. This guy was OSS. He spoke multiple languages. He had three different degrees. Um, he was an intelligence officer in World War II. OSS is the forerunner of the CIA. And he basically gave a deathbed confession. The woman you see is Carolyn Rankin, and they're both pastors, Jim and Carolyn Rankin out of San Antonio. They're both pastors. And so they, they look at the camera and say, what you're about to hear is true, and all that is in the testimony and the film in their own words. The bottom line is they asked Colonel Hill, was Roswell real? And Hill, this is like a month before he died. Hill looks at, looks at them and says, yes, it wasn't a weather balloon. And I was flown from Dallas-Fort Worth to Roswell within 48 hours after the crash, and I was attempted, asked to make contact with one of the retrieved alien bodies that was still alive. I was unsuccessful in doing this. The wreckage was shipped to Wright-Patterson. That's his words. Can I prove that? No, but I believe these two. So it's secondhand information. Do with it what you will. Why would Colonel Hill lie a month before he dies to two people who have no ax to grind in the UFO community? He got something off of his chest because he never told anyone before that. So that, that's what's going on. Dr. Jesse Marcel Jr., who I interviewed, um, he's deceased now. Um, the interview was, was, was all handwritten, <clears throat> but I met him in person and we, and we chatted the whole thing up. <clears throat> and he told me that um, that event basically tore his family apart because his father was, his father's reputation just went boom like that. And everyone laughed at him. How could you possibly mistake a weather balloon for a UFO? And so he lived with that until Stan Friedman, who passed away several weeks ago, by the way, heard the story, went in and interviewed him, and then it broke the whole Roswell cover-up, which of course is what it was. That's, that's, that's his father holding the remains of a weather balloon. It was a setup, a photo shoot for the press, and he comes in and he's kind of looking at General Ramey going like, why are you doing this to me? Body language means everything. Look at his body language. It could have looked something like this. Mark my words, and I'm not a prophet. But at some point in time, and I would say maybe by the end of this year, but there's no way of knowing, you're going you're gonna to turn on Tucker Carlson and you're going to see something like that. 
or a piece of the wreckage or something. Maybe a scientist comes on with a piece of the wreckage and he goes, we've had this metal analyzed and it's not from this earth. Maybe they don't show you that. Maybe they just show you a piece of the wreckage which doesn't come from the planet, which is another rung up the ladder. But at some point they will go up another rung on the ladder because we are in the midst of disclosure. Why? This is called the coming great deception. Cattle mutilation, 10,000 unsolved mutilations since 1967. The cows are taken, the blood is removed, Sometimes you can see that, that, that cow in the middle and all the other cows have run away from it. Vultures don't, don't take it. Coyotes don't take the carcass. Uh, no wild animal, and coyotes will eat anything. We all know that. They don't get near it. Vultures don't get near it and the carcass just lays. The media law enforcement won't discuss it. We get things like this where the flesh <clears throat> is excised from the animal with laser-like precision. All the blood is drained. Sometimes the sex organs are cored out. Sometimes the anus is cored out. Other times the, the heart, which is actually surrounded by the pericardium, is actually pulled out of the pericardium without the pericardium. The sac surrounds the heart being ripped. How is that possible? It's impossible. You can't do that. And then they drop the carcass back in the, in the field, and there's no footprints. How does that work? And there are thousands of them, thousands of them, and law enforcement doesn't even cover it anymore for the most part. And we've got a whole file on this stuff, and we've had people on farms call me up and tell me very hair-raising stories. This is what it looks like. Eyes are cored out, rectums are cored out, sex organs, udders are cored out, ears are cored out, eyes are cored out, and the animals are left for dead. They are dropped deliberately in the farmer's field. Why? Because it creates the greatest amount of fear. Something is being harvested. Linda Moulton Howe, who broke the story decades ago, called it a strange harvest. Most, mostly it happens out in New Mexico, Arizona, in the Four Corners area, but it can also happen in other places. And it's very, very strange and very bizarre. And usually ranchers and farm people will see lights in the sky for days or sometimes weeks before the animal is mutilated. Sometimes it's, it's several animals over a rapid succession in the same field. It's bizarre. It's a strange harvest. Why are we doing this? And then if you can do that, why drop it back in the farmer's field? Why do it? Because they want to do it. They want to call attention to it. This is what we're up against. This is what we're up against. And, and the farmers can't do anything. Bills and plant extraction, high strangers in the operating theater. So there was this guy, Bill, who was 45 years old, who came to us, actually through Richard Shaw. He's about seven feet tall. He's a former basketball player. He was changing Richard's smoke detectors. And what do you do? I make documentary films. Oh, wow, about what? UFOs. I have an implant. That's how the conversation starts. I have an implant. What do you mean you have an implant? So Bill was taken when he was five years old. When we met up with him, he was 45. How did he know it was an implant? He remembers being, I can't do that. Oh, sorry, good save, LA, good save. He remembers being taken. The grays came into the room. He fights them off the first time. Second time they come in the room, he goes up through the ceiling. There is no fight. Right up through the ceiling. He remembers his pajamas flapping in the wind like this as he goes up through the ceiling. We all know that that's impossible, yet that's what happened. He claims to have an implant in his leg. We did an x-ray, which is what you see there. The implant is right here. So you can, oops, that's your, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> the implant is right there. That's the implant, right there. We did, we did an x-ray, we did a CAT scan, we did um, ultrasound, we did um, a gauss meter, the thing was putting out 8.5 milligauss, how is that possible? A little thing the size of a grain of rice, putting out as much magnetic field energy as Richard's fully charged battery as camera, how is that possible? Let, putting off a radio frequency, what are we looking at here? How is it possible? So when we, when we took him to get, the, um, to get the implant out, we went to Dr. Matriciana's office, he's the surgeon that took the implant out. Matriciana takes his wand from the uh, from the ultrasound machine, he looks at where the, where the thing is, he puts a little X there and he goes like this, and within a minute, he finds it. There it is on the ultrasound. Oh, there's the implant, we'll see in two weeks, we'll take it out. Two weeks passes, we come, we have three, three camera crews are there, we've got 20 people, 15 to 20 people in a, watching the proceedings on an HD monitor, real big 60 inch HD monitor in another room. I'm there with Richard, we've got Dr. Matriciana, Dr. Roger Lear, this was all his research, we've got nurses, it's a big production for us. <clears throat> and Bill's on the table, I'm figuring like, we'll be out of here in 20 minutes, we'll go to an early lunch. Boy, was I wrong. He takes the wand, 
puts the X where the X where the, where the implant was on his leg. He does this for an hour and 20 minutes, trying to find it. For an hour and 20 minutes, can't find it. He looks at Dr. Roger Lear and goes, maybe we should go get another X-ray. Dr. Roger Lear goes, no, we know it's there. We saw it. So at this moment in time, I'm in a room full of non-believers except for Richard. No one believes like we believe. We're spirit-filled Christians. And the Holy Spirit taps me on the shoulder. And he says, you need to take authority over this, and you need to do it right now. So I'm in a room full of non-believers, and I wasn't politically correct. I didn't go, hey, guys, you know, this might sound weird, and I don't want to stretch you out of your paradigm, and I don't want to offend anyone. I'm really sorry if I do. No. It was like, this is what I said. Hey, guys, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to do it now. That was it. I didn't ask for permission. I just did it. Why? Because they're all in romper room, and I say that with great respect. They have no idea what's going on, and think supernatural. They, I don't have time to explain it to them. The Spirit of the Living God just told me what I need to do. I need to take authority over this thing. And so I said, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to do it now. And the prayer went something like this. Not some long, drawn-out, oh, great Father in heaven, nothing like that. It was just, Father, if there are forces which are cloaking this device, I pray that you would break their power and do it soon. That's what I said. Guess what? About a minute and 20 seconds later, not even, whatever it was, this is what shows up, and this is the implant on the ultrasound right there. And everybody goes, oh my gosh, what's that? And I go, and, and Patriciana goes, that's the implant. He finds it. He takes the wand, takes it off, bangs it like this, looks at it, puts it back on the leg, it shows up again. They're all going like, what's going on here? Because he just went over that strip of flesh for the last hour and 20 minutes, couldn't find Doodley Scott. One prayer changes the atmosphere. I'm looking at Richard, we're just cracking up. It's one of those few times where you actually pray and God really shows up, full power, and just goes, okay, cloaking device off, thank you, we're going to pull this thing out. So, we pulled the thing out. And when I started talking about implants way back in 1999, I had Christian brothers and sisters laugh at me and call me absolutely crazy. And this is why when we did this, now it's crickets. You can't say anything. Here's the guy. Here's the whole procedure that we did. Here are the protocols that we followed. This is the implant. He was taken. We took it out. High strangers in the operating room. The thing was cloaked. One prayer shows us that we have the authority and the power by the blood of a lamb, by the blood of Jesus, to go after these things. We have the authority. So if, if you say you're being abducted, if you're being oppressed, so you come here, you get together with about 10, 15 people or whatever. You fast, you pray together collectively and you break through. That's how we break through. It's not so easy because we've got 1.5 billion abortions on the planet, but we can still break through because we have the power. And greater is he and it is in us than he that is in the world. We can break through, but it takes effort. It's not a five second prayer. Sometimes we've got to come together and fast and pray and go before the Lord. And guess what? We'll break through the barrier. But that's, that's what we've got to understand, that we're in a warfare is different now. It's not like it was 50 years ago or whatever, or 25 years ago. It's completely different. The game is ratcheted up. 1.5 billion abortions has changed the atmosphere. And unless the church gets serious about fasting and praying and coming together collectively and going after specific things, we won't see victory. We won't. But we can have victory if we begin to do that. So we look at this thing. There's the implant. We make the incision. Dr. Matriciana makes the incision. Dr. Lear's assisting on the right. We spread the wound open. We spread the incision open, not the wound. We spread the incision open. And we get the first look at the implant right there. All of this is on film. It's irrefutable. All of it's on film. There's the implant. And here's Dr. Roger Lear assisting. This is what the implant looks like. Someone put the implant in Bill's leg. Why? Someone has been spending a whole lot of time and energy putting implants in people, abducting them and taking them and doing this. Why are they doing this? And see, as a secular person, they don't have a clue because they don't work from a biblical prophetic worldview. So it's just, well, uh, these extraterrestrials are doing something here that we don't know, but whatever. But from a biblical point of view, I'm looking at this and I'm starting to wonder, what's going on here? What's with this implant? And I'll get to it in just a little bit. 
Hybrids amongst us. I want to show you this. Is there a breeding program or hybrids walking amongst us? The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. It will be like the days of Noah, which is an ancient prophetic warning. Their seed shall mingle with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to them. From the book of Daniel. <coughs> and this is where we are. The seed mingling that we see all throughout the Genesis narrative is no longer applicable. What we see is the seed mingling, but there's no marriage contract, which is exactly what we see in modernity when people were taken. When men are taken now, sperm is taken from the men, ovum is taken from the women. Sometimes they are reabducted and they, they see their child two or three years later, and the child looks like, like some sort of a hybrid. In the, in the early days, like in the early 90s, the child looked very sick. Now it's a whole different deal. Now they can pass. They pass for human. There might be some of them sitting right here. No, just joking. That's not funny, LA. So Pastor Mike, I'll just do this verbatim because I, I know what these are. I don't need to read them. I can do it faster if I, if, I, if I just say it. So Pastor Mike is doing a prayer walk and <clears throat> he's, he's reading about little cards and notes and he's just praying in the spirit and just asking the Lord to bless people and heal people and all this stuff. It's a beautiful summer day in June. In the distance, he sees a woman. She's very athletic. She's about 6'3", six, 6'4", six, striking platinum blonde hair, pulled back in a ponytail. Very athletic, and she's running. He's bothered, but he's not sure why. Something's troubling him, but he can't put his finger on it. As the woman gets closer, that feeling of oppression and, and anxiety grows grows even you know more pronounced in him. Um, as, as they come closer, she sees that she has striking blue eyes. Their eyes meet. As she was in about 10 feet, the eyes go totally black. And as she runs by him, she bares her teeth and growls. And he's in a warfare stance at this point. He's rebuking her in the name of Jesus and stating that no curse or no foul or unclean thing. Psalm 91 is basically what he's, what he's reciting. The second one is a woman and her husband and her two children are at a fair in Iowa. Little county fair thing. The kids are on a Ferris wheel. All of a sudden, in front of them, walking towards the, the Ferris wheel, are a, a, a young man and a young woman that look like brother and sister. They're dressed kind of oddly, and they walk and sink in a very weird way. They're weird looking. And she looks at the husband, and the husband sees these two characters and you know, gives, her, gives them a look and stuff. They go up to where the in a carnival, they have like a Ferris wheel thing. There's always a gate there with a line. The kids try to go through the gate. And, and the operator goes, what are you guys doing? Like, like, are you guys on crack or something? It's like, no, the, 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 the thing is rolling. You can't go on until the ride's over. So the ride ends. The, uh, the boy and the girl, their boy and the girl, come off the ride, and they get back with their parents, and they begin to walk. She turns to look at the two weirdos, and they are looking at her, but their necks, I can't do it, obviously, her, their necks are stretched in an absolutely an inhuman way. You can't do that. They're, they're arched. The necks are elongated and arched, and they are leering at her, leering at her, jeering at her. She's totally freaked out. Doesn't say anything. When the kids are put to bed, she goes to her husband, and she says, what do you think that was? And her husband looks at her and says, whatever they were, they weren't human. Now, I have the names, of course, and it's all in my files. These people want to remain anonymous. She's, her last line was, I wish I had never seen this. It is happening. It is happening. It is happening. We are, going to, we are starting to see stuff already, and you shouldn't be scared because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in me, in you, than he that is in the world. Al's encounter, I'll let this roll. It's getting kind of late. But I'm going to let this roll. You, you can watch what happens. The backstory is this, <clears throat> that <clears throat> oh, for a fisherman's friend, oh, it's a lozenger. <clears throat> I'm yelling too much. I'm losing my voice. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. <clears throat> Al's, Al was <clears throat> taken from a very early age over and over and over again. He was taken. Abducted. Just one. Is, are these what I think they are? Yeah, the guy with the long little horny thing. I have to say it. I don't want to say it, but I have to. <laughs> Ricola! <clears throat> right? See, you got to have some laughter. You got to. Oh, this stuff is so dark. Trust me. <clears throat> I have characters that I divert to. So you don't mind if I make disgusting noises while I'm trying to talk, okay? So Al's been abducted 
<clears throat> Don't you wish you had one? So <clears throat> Al's been abducted. <clears throat> he flees the eastern part of Canada to go to Vancouver, where he is now. And <clears throat> Al's a mover. <clears throat> and in the process of moving, he gets a call from this woman who comes in from Kuwait. Normal looking gal, dressed really nicely, real pretty, except she's got these really tight glasses on that are dark. They look like swimmer's goggles almost, but they're not swimmer's goggles. They're glasses and they're really tight or won't allow any light in. He figures maybe she's got like a comb or something, I don't know. So he just doesn't notice it. Oh, that feels so good, thank you, thank you. And they're riding up in the freight elevator to go look at her stuff so they can move it. And she leans forward, just the two of them, just Al and this woman with the weird glasses. She leans forward and she goes, they're listening, Al. And Al goes, who's listening? And she goes, you know, the Greys. I know that you've been taken, just as I've been taken many times. We were supposed to meet on the ship. Al's totally freaked out at this point. So in the course of his move, and you'll see it, he gives the woman his phone number. And you'll see it in the clip. I go, mistake number one. And so now she calls him up, and he goes up to her flat, mistake number two. And she's with a girlfriend, and I'll just let the thing speak for itself. This is what happened, and it is bizarre. I walked into their place, I buzzed up, her friend answered the door, it was her apartment, a beautiful two-story condo right on the Fraser River, in obviously in BC, and they're both out on the deck and they have these big, big glasses of wine. Now, did, this, did the friend look normal to you? Totally normal. Okay. And she no, introduced her. No sunglasses? Her. No, no, just normal. Okay. No sunglasses. Right. She introduced her to me. And I could tell they'd been drinking, and I, you know, I'm not passing judgment, they're having some fun. And um, she introduced her friend, we sat down on the deck, she's still wearing those strange glasses. Their glasses of wine are right in front of me on a table, and out of the corner of my eye, I noticed this massive black fly in her wine glass. And it's almost like it was stuck to the glass. It didn't make sense. It wasn't moving. And I pointed it to her. I said, oh, look, there's a big fly in your wine glass. I'll grab some Kleenex and get it for you. She smiled at me and she goes, no, I'll get it. She put her finger in the wine glass. She didn't crush the fly. The fly stuck to her finger. And she put it towards her mouth and went like this. <laughs> and I just looked at her and I go, holy smokes. I go, if you're hungry. I can make you a sandwich. Why did you do that? And she just smiled again. So that's the starting of how strange this got, and it only got stranger. Uh, from there, she took off her glasses. She got on top of me while, while I was sitting in my chair, and she started lifting up my shirt. And I said, what are you doing? And she goes, oh, uh, how old are you? You're well preserved. Let me stop you there. So this is not typical behavior for you? No, not at all. Okay, so this um, is something normally you wouldn't, you wouldn't mm, allow this? No, okay. I figured it's because she'd been drinking, but it got a little carried away when she started asking me how old I was. And the glasses were off, as I said, she went to kiss me and I pushed her away and her eyes shape shifted. Now when you say, say what, what did they look like before, what are they? Just they normal, I, I don't know if they're brown eyes, or they certainly weren't uh, like blue eyes or emerald eyes, I would have noticed that right away. I think they were just normal, uh, darker uh, looking eyes, but, but the whites were white. Uh, when I pushed her back, when she went to kiss me, I pushed her back, her eyes shape shifted. They went, the whites went to a golden color with black streaks and her pupils shrunk. I upset her and that's what happened. When I pushed her back, her eyes shape shifted and I pushed her off me. That was my reaction. And I said, what the heck was that? And she gave me the most evil laugh you've ever heard. And I got the heck out of there. So you ran out of there? I ran out of there and she was chasing me. I'm not telling now, you now, anymore. Did, I was the, just... did the pupils, were they, were they round pupils or were round. they serpentine? Round. Okay, round pupils. Yeah, what I would describe her eyes as 
it's like a snake eyes or a reptile's eyes. Reptile's eyes. There's a thing we call UFO brain fog, <clears throat> where, you know, I ask him, would you allow this? And no, no one's ever questioned him that way, you know? And, and he's, it's, like, it's almost like for the first time he realizes that why would he even allow her on top of him like this? When, you, when we're in the presence, and hopefully this will never happen for any of us in this room, but when we're around this stuff, <clears throat> let me ask you something. How many people have been around someone who was demon-possessed? Okay. When you got up to them, could you think straight? It can be really weird. <clears throat> it can be really weird. It's hard to think straight sometimes because you're dealing with supernatural stuff. It's, it's like the, the, the several times... I've done one on the phone with a woman and I was completely clear the whole time. But there was another one that came into a church and this woman was absolutely possessed. She, you know, she had the whole grin, the whole thing. And just approaching her, the, the oppression was just like, whoa. You know, and that's why fasting and praying and all that is like, sometimes we have to do that. The bottom line is there's like brain fog. There's this clip in the film where these girls... <clears throat> Like 10 of them are in a car, a station wagon. They're coming back from a dance and they see a light and they pull over and they realize it's, it's not, no one's mud running, it's some kind of UFO. <clears throat> and the woman goes, we got in the car, we were speeding, but we weren't going anywhere. That's UFO brain fog. You can't be speeding and not going anywhere. The mind has no grid in which to deal with what they're seeing, what they're experiencing, and it short circuits us out. So, this stuff is real, and it's coming down, and the coming great deception is basically all around us. The New Agers talk about this event, the event of the paradigm shift of consciousness, that when E.T. comes back, they're going to move us into a golden age. Um, and I'm just going to pass on this because it's kind of getting late. Some things at the other side of the, uh, of the aisle are saying the arrest of the global elites, the reset of the financial system, the release of ET information, the beginning of a new financial system with prosperity funds for all humanity. Sounds like communism to me. And uh, humanity will enter a golden age. When the event arrives, there shall be an international washover. It shall remain within each one on different levels. This is what new age people are saying through channeled information, okay? It shall remain with each one on different levels of different degrees of frequency according to each one's position of self. This we have also mentioned before. However, once this has taken place, each soul shall come back round in their own time. So we cannot give you hours, days, etc. Yet we choose to say anything up to a week of your time before one feels the need to even think about normality again. And normality will not be normal ever again. Our point to you is this. This event will take place and it is drawing ever closer. A one world government and a one world religious system we know from the Bible that that's how it's going to happen. Now is the time to address the UFO phenomenon. All history, when it happens, and I truly believe when full disclosure happens, the church will not be here. Um, all history will be referred to as BD or AD, before disclosure or after disclosure. This event is the biggest life-changing event on the planet. Uh, this is the ultimate game changer, the ultimate instant global paradigm shift. When ET comes and they, and they finally reveal themselves, they will say this, we seeded all life on this planet. We are your creators. We are your progenitors. We genetically manipulated early man. We started the world's first civilizations. We started the world's religions. Now at this critical juncture, we, ET, have come back in to usher mankind into a golden age. That's what they're going to say. They will bear gifts. The first thing that they will show us is free energy, which completely changes the entire planet changes the whole financial system, changes everything. Because if energy is free, there is no electric bill anymore. And I truly believe that they have zero point energy and that's what they will show us. But they'll have something else that they will give us. And I'm gonna pass on that. That's a dreadful movie, by the way. I'm gonna pass on this. Hold on. I just wanna check something out here. Okay, good. Sorry. Because of the time, it's now nine o'clock. I want to. I'm going to skip those two things. Um, what was written will come to pass. What was foretold is unfolding right in front of us. Okay. 
Isaac Newton, about the time of the man, the body of men will be raised up who will turn their attention to the prophecies and insist on their little interpretation in the midst of much clamor and opposition. People will be terrified at what they see coming upon the earth, for the powers in the heavens will be shaken. That's a quote from Jesus. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Even the elect would be deceived if that were possible. The dragon will come with all signs and lying wonders. This is what E.T. will tell us. We've already talked about that. Criteria one from the book of Revelation. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or their forehead, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who understands calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. His number is 666. See the implant? I believe that that's the mark. Whoever's doing it has spent an inordinate amount of time on this. He, Bill had it 40 years ago. It's actually more like 48 years ago because it was a while since we removed it. He was five years old when they took him and implanted him. This implant we could cut with a razor knife. The, that was number 17 that Dr. L in the last implant he took out. Number 16 was made of a material so hard the only way they could cut it open was in a laboratory was a laser. That was it. So this, there's been an uh, evolution between this early implant from, from like 45 or 50 years ago to the more recent ones. The one from decades ago you could cut with a razor knife. The new ones, laser beam. They're evolving. Is it possible that what we are looking at, and by the way, these things, we, we used to think that they were powered by the blood, the circulatory system, now we think they're powered by the nervous system. And the body did not expunge the implant from Bill. In fact, there was like a covering over the implant, which we have no idea what that covering was, like a rubbery-like substance, and it seemed like nerve endings actually embraced it. And when we were there, it was shut off. But before, we, and, and that's what's chilling about that, they knew that we were going to take it out. That's why it was shut off. That's why it was cloaked. We couldn't even find it. That was a supernatural experience we had. This, in my opinion, these implants are prototypes of the coming mark of the beast. Here's what E.T. will say. We created you, and because of that, we are your creators. We now have an implant which will extend your lifespan three to 500 years disease-free. Disease-free. Three to 500 years without any type of disease at all. You'll live longer and have a wonderful life. That's how it's going to be couched, in my opinion. And of course, this whole thing will have, it'll do a lot more than just buy, sell, or trade. It will change your DNA so that you, not you, but the person who takes it, becomes the seed of the dragon. You become a Nephilim. You're no longer human. You become some sort of a mix of hybrid. That's what we think it is. It's all conjecture. Call me crazy. I don't care. That's what I think, and I'm sticking to it with all my guns. Because look at this. Criteria two, another angel, a third, followed him, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of the ancient of days wrath. That's my kind of interpretation. This was given to a MUFON meeting, non-Christians, and so I couched it in a way that they would understand, ancient of days but it's the Lord God. That's what it is in the book of Revelation. And the bottom line is, is there any redemption there? Is there any, is there any grace and mercy? Where, where, is, where, where, does, where is grace and mercy suspended throughout the biblical prophetic narrative? Anytime the Nephilim are present, there's no grace and mercy. Every place, look at Nineveh for crying out loud. Nineveh was like a hellhole. I mean, you walk into Nineveh and heads were on stakes. Oh, there's Uncle Fred right there. I wonder what happened to him. I mean, it's crazy. That's Nineveh. And he sends Jonah to Nineveh, grace and mercy, and they repent. You take the mark, you become something else. You wind up in the lake of fire. Why? That, is that severe? Yes, it's severe. I get that. But why is it severe? 
because something is changing the very fabric of our humanity. And it's, I think it's this implant. In the hand or on the forehead. We've had two people who were abducted and taken and implanted. One was a male, the other one was a female. Both of them had implants right above the eyebrow. That's the forehead. Both of them had implants there. Both of them did the same thing. They got tired of feeling the bump, they took a razor blade and cut it open themselves. The thing dropped down in the sink. Did you save it? No, I flushed it down, I wanted to get rid of it. They didn't know me then, but they came forward later. This stuff is real, but we've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. All I'm doing here, let's get to criteria three, in those days men will seek death and will not find it. They, desire, they will desire to die and death will flee from them. The reason why I wrote that and the reason why I think the implant lengthens the, the lifespan is because of this birth. In other words, is it possible that the lifespan is, is lengthened via the implant? They're changing your DNA. We know from science that there's some kind of gene which kicks in in our DNA which makes us grow old. What if that little chip reverses that, and that's what I think is happening with it. So the lifespan is lengthened. Everybody celebrates because does it, isn't mankind, don't, don't we all want, especially the other side, they all want to live to, like, look, look at trans, transhumanism. Look what the, what the new age people were saying. You know, we want to live. We want to be able to move our consciousness into avatars and all this other stuff. That's what they all want. They're going to get it. But it's not the what they think it is. It'll come from the pit of hell. Well, that will extend the lifespan, yeah, but you'll get grievous sores on your body. That's not a good thing. People will seek death in those days and not find it. What does that mean? Seek death in those days and not find it. Is the Bible crazy? How can you seek death and not find it? You can't die. Why? Because the body regenerates itself because of the implant. No matter what you do, the, the implant is so powerful that your body just regenerates. Why do you think David cut the head off Goliath? Because he knew exactly what Goliath was, and he knew the only way he could really kill the thing was to completely decapitate it. Completely decapitate it. This is where we are. This is where we are. The medic, this is from Dr. Jacques Vallée, who is on the other side of the aisle. He does not, he's, he's a secular guy, but he believes, as I do, that these are not extraterrestrials. The medical examination to which abductees are said to be subjected, often accompanied by sadistic sexual manipulation, is reminiscent of the medieval tales of encounters with demons. It makes no sense in a sophisticated or technical framework. Any intelligent being equipped with the scientific marvels that UFOs possess would be in a position to achieve any of these things any of these alleged scientific objectives in a shorter time and with fewer risks. What is the good news? When you see these things begin to happen, look up. Look, I'm not making any of this up. This is all hardcore research that we've done, I've done over since I was 16. I've been plowing into this. Since I became a Christian 39 years ago, this June, this is, you know, this is my calling. This is what the Lord has, has put me here. The object isn't to scare you, it's to inform you. Again, we've not been given a spirit of fear, but a power, a love, and a sound mind. If you're afraid, you need to take that to the Lord. What it should do is it should make you outraged, outraged that we're living in a society in a time like this where the, the evil one, where the dragon and his forces have managed to completely pull the wool over people's eyes and allow 1.5 billion abortions that the church remains silent. Get, get excited. Get outraged. You have been armed in the last four sessions that we've done. You know you will not be deceived when they start showing this nonsense to Tucker Carlson, and they will. They will roll it out. You will not be deceived. You now know the truth, at least in part. I don't have all the answers. Nobody does. But you've been armed. And we should rejoice in the fact that you've been armed. Even the elect would be deceived if that were possible. You saw the clip from Fatima, where people are, are, are freaking out, you know, that whole, from the movie. And they see the, the so-called miracle of the sun happening in modernity. And they're like, oh, screaming and yelling and all this stuff. No one's standing up. In the name of Jesus, the Lord rebuke you. Shut up and go away. No one's saying that. If you see something and you don't know what it is, don't think about it. Rebuke first, ask questions later. I am giving you tools. I'm arming you. Rebuke first, ask questions later. Know our authority that we have as born-again spirit-filled believers. Know that when we invoke the name of Jesus, sometimes it may take two or three people getting together to do it. But rebuke first, ask questions later. You're not sure of something? You're frightened, you're afraid, not be given a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Look at the thing. Square on. The Lord rebuke you. Get out of here. Et follow. Come out. In the Greek, come out. 
Get out of here. Show. The Lord rebuke you. Leave. Go. Get angry. Man, I'm so ticked off I can't even tell you. How dare you come in this place? How dare you show up? How dare you do this? Outrage. Outrage. How dare you take a five-year-old and implant him? How dare you do that? We got to get fired up, folks. And you got to decide what we're going to do, how you're going to react to this. You have been warned and armed. You are now officially dangerous. You really are. Because you, you might not be able to be as articulate because I've been doing this forever, but you'll be able to give an answer. If people come up to you and start asking you about this stuff, you'll be able to give an answer. And that's what we're told to do. I'm going to take a couple of questions. We'll go 15 minutes to like 25 after. And that'll be it. I'd love to have a microphone so I could hear the questions, Phil. So stand up and Phil will get that microphone and go back to you. We'll do a short Q&A. And I'm going to pray over you before I let you leave here, okay? I really enjoyed your lecture. It's been quite enlightening. Thank you. Um, one question. Uh, there is a telescope that the Vatican was in charge of building called the Lucifer Telescope. Yes. Can you enlighten us anything about recent research that's come out of there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Vat Tom Horn did a lot of research on this with uh, his protege who passed away, um, uh, uh, Chris Putnam. Um, the Vatican bought the property and they called the telescope the Lucifer Telescope. Why is the Vatican so interested in what's coming? Because they all, they're on the inside. They know what's going on. They know that they're here. Um, they've, it, what's interesting is the last Pope, uh, Benedict, uh, was a staunch believer in Fatima. And then right after he became Pope, he just went, oh, Fatima was for another time. And I think he was briefed, and then there was a coup, and the Jesuit took over. So the Lucifer, and the Lucifer Telescope, they know what's out there, and you know they're seeing all sorts of stuff. Anything else? I assume you already heard about Captain Beard, like his encounter with the extraterrestrial Captain Beard, like he was an explorer, and Captain Beard. A bird, how do you say his name? Oh, bird, yeah. 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 And what, what was your point of view on that? To Antarctica. I, I know the story. Yes, the, he was a popular explorer and suddenly they just shut him down. Um, the whole thing with the Admiral Bird diary is you can't vet it. And I've tried to vet it. I can't vet it. So I, although I know the story, and it's very colorful, that Admiral Bird allegedly, you know, the hollow earth in, the, in Antarctica and this whole thing. But Steve Krell's taught, written a book called Empire Beneath the Ice. I do know this. The Nazis were absolutely fascinated with Antarctica. They had a base in Antarctica called New Schwabenland. A lot, lots of U-boats went missing at the end of World War II and were never found. I believe Hitler escaped Germany and lived to a ripe old age in South America. Um, and that's last year, Hunting Hitler was one of my favorite shows. I think they proved it beyond a reasonable doubt. He definitely escaped Der Führer bunker, and the skulls that the Russians have forensically don't, don't add up, in my opinion. So they were, uh, they were fascinated with Antarctica. Um, there's all sorts of stories coming out of Antarctica. I can't vet them, so I don't really go with them. You know, are there great pyramids down there and all this crashed UFOs and alien bases? Well, yeah, maybe, who knows? But I do know this, stuff out in Area 51, they do have saucers, because I talked to Bob Lazar, and Lazar was stationed there, and there were UFOs. And I think we're going to be seeing more of this. Look, when again, when Tucker Carlson sits down with Luis Elizondo and asks him, does the United States government have in their possession debris from crashed UFOs, and Elizondo says yes, need I say more? Next question. Okay, the Nephilim, are they um, evil spirits? Are they the byproduct of human and angels? I, I've got several questions. I'll throw them all together so then you can kind of hash it out. Then the other thing is, is like the fallen angels that were with women that were destroyed, the Nephilim and stuff that were destroyed with the flood, obviously that happened, that's happened again. And so, so, I mean, Nephilim are the byproducts or Nephilim are... 
the fallen angels. Nephilim is a broad term for the different tribes, the Zanzamim, the Emims, the Anakim, the Rephaim. Um, they're all names which I, I believe, in my opinion, uh, denote certain genetic characteristics. But the Nephilim are the byproduct of the unholy union of the fallen angelic beings, the women of Earth, cohabiting together and creating a hybrid entity known in a broad sense as a Nephilim. There are many incursions. The first one happens pre-flood. The other one happens again after the flood and so on until the cross, then it all goes away and it changes. So what are, what are unclean spirits and demons? Demons are the disembodied spirits of a Nephilim. Demons are the disembodied spirits of a Nephilim. They need something to inhabit. Demons, in my opinion, are not fallen angels. Two totally different things. Demons are the disembodied spirits of a Nephilim. Oh. Area 51, where is it? And we used to hear about the Bermuda Triangle. We haven't heard anything lately. At least I haven't. Um, could you expound upon that? Area 51 is outside of, of Las Vegas. I've been there several times. Uh, we actually were at the Little Alien last year uh, and had a hamburger there. Delicious burger, by the way. Um, I met Bob Lazar out there in like 1994, something like that. And this is when Lazar's story had just broke about handling uh, UFO and material and back engineering and all this stuff that was out at Area 51. Uh, Gary Schultz, who we interviewed and showed the clip uh, in our In Their Own Wars, UFOs Are Real in the film, uh, Schultz was out there in um, 89, 90, something like that, well before anyone even knew what Area 51 was, and he had this beautiful shot of what he called a human pilot alien craft right over um, Area 51. It was taken, I think, on a Wednesday night by a place called the Mailbox, where you could go and see this stuff in 89. All that's changed. The federal government came in and brought more land. The Mailbox area is completely closed. You can't go there anymore. But yeah, I mean, it's like the fact that the, the, fact that the United States in 2017 admitted that Area 51 existed, that's part of the thing. And so here's Commander Fravor with the F-18 and, and the pilot. Commander Fravor, the pilot, in the tic-tac shape, UFO, that was not of this world. At the same time, a few days later, Harry Reid, you have it's a secret government studying UFOs, and then the government admits it in the reality of Area 51. All happening in the month of December of 2017. That was the first initial wave of disclosure. And then since then, like I said and showed you, up to Tucker Carlson with Luis Elizondo, we've got crashed alien, alien UFOs. We've, we've got them. I mean, come on. It's coming. It's coming. The Bermuda Triangle. What was that? The Bermuda Triangle. Oh, yeah, the Bermuda Triangle. I actually wrote um, and studied this. It was fascinating. Um, that's a three-hour conversation. Basically, it is. It's, it's very complex. There was a squadron of fighters that vanished when looking for another group of planes, um, countless ships that vanished. Some people say it's methane gas and all this other stuff. Um, there are places in the world, where there are gateways and portals. Um, there was this one guy, I think it was on some show on the History Channel, where a guy's in like a Piper Club and he goes, he goes through this like tunnel and he has missing time. Gary Stearman also was, was in, in, the, in the air for a number of hours. Well, there's no way the plane could stay up that long, and it stood up that long. And I've always had trouble with that with Gary, because, wow, Gary, why would, look, what is the Merkava? What is the divine taxi, as Mike Heiser would call it? What, how is Elijah, Elijah taken up? We don't know. Um, in a whirlwind, the fiery chariot, what are the fiery chariots that um, uh, Alicia points out to his servant? And, you know, and, and all this other stuff. So there's a lot of stuff we don't understand. But when Gary Stearman saw it, it was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. Gary Stearman has been in aircraft and flying since he could, probably before he could walk. I mean, his whole life was immersed in this. What better way to get his attention than showing him something like that? Shortly after that, he became a Christian. Next question. Um, so about the abductions and implants, do you think that people could have been like, there's people out there who have been abducted who don't know that received an implant, and if so, how many? No, no. People, most people know that they've been taken. Most most people know. Um, they have memories that keep coming up. They figure it out. They know something's up, and sometimes they come to me, 
And if they have an implant, the first thing we say is go get an x-ray. Tell them you had a, an accident as a kid and you fell off your bike and there's something in your leg and just check it to see if there's something there. And the x-ray will tell you if it's a metallic implant. We know that there are portals on the earth. Uh, you know, the Bible clearly talks about angels moving up and down and we know uh, Temple Mount, Mount Moriah, Maria. Uh, it's there, there's a place out in Samaria and there's several other places. But the question was asked to me to ask is this, uh, when you entertain uh, things like Ouija boards, uh, uh, when you start getting overly involved in uh, Dungeon Drag and Dragons or uh, watching videos that are consistently pushing the evil agenda, does that open up a portal? 100%. Absolutely. You can't do that stuff. You know, the, the movies that are crafted today in Hollywood, the games that are crafted by the, these, they're crazy. I mean, they're just absolutely wacky. You can't play eight hours of video games or two hours of video games blowing up people and killing people. You don't think that that does something to your psyche? Of course it does. You can't watch movies like The Exorcist or all this. I mean, every, we, we don't go to movies anymore. We don't go to movies anymore because there's nothing but junk and slime. When you, when you watch, you know, laugh what you want, but when you go and you watch the Avengers, they're Nephilim. That's what you're looking at. They're hybrid beings that are human beings with power. That's why we're all getting set up for this. I'm not making this up. And everybody goes, well, let's go to the Avengers movie far out. Or Wolverine, he's a chimera. It's right out of the Book of Enoch. Wolverine's a, as a chimera. He's part wolf, part man. It's Greek mythos. It's a Nephilim. The Book of Enoch says that the angels sinned against the animal kingdom. We've had reports, and I won't get into them. Dogmen, centaurs, all sorts of stuff. It's crazy. And these are sane people that come to me because, you know why they come to me? Because they trust me. Because they know I won't laugh at them. And I, I, that's why I get the stories. And they're hair-raising, and they're very troublesome. But I want to take one more question, and I want to pray over you guys. Sloan. Um, so the cattle mutilations, I used to live in Texas and I used to see a lot of that. Is that to open portals, all that crazy stuff they're doing to the cattle? We think that the blood, I think, the conjecture, I think the blood is used in the reproduction system to make the hybrids for gestation because bovine blood can be used in human transplants. They can do that. You can use, you can use cow blood instead of human blood when you're, when you're you know, that isn't that crazy? been used. But I want to pray over you guys because this is really important, okay? So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. In the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, the one who died in our place, the one who holds the keys of life and death in his hands, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the once and future king, the one who has already crushed the head of a serpent. We come to you in his mighty name and we pray, Father, that every person in this room will leave charged up and we cancel the assignment of the enemy for anything that is a spirit of fear and we speak blessing and hope and goodness and outrage that these things are even happening over every person in this room. We pray a blessing over them. We pray for a peaceful, wonderful night's sleep. But we also pray, Father, that you would bring these things back to your people and encourage them so when they see signs, they're bold and they can speak out against them. It's time for us to stand up. Help these people here, Lord, stand up. Help them make a commitment. Help them to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Bless them. Bless their going out and their coming in. Bless them. Bless them in every way. Bless them. Bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.